and he does everything in his power to preserve our delicate inside. Bob Strom still works at Boeing. He spends as much time as he can now with his family. He hasn't told his young grandson here that he's dying of leukemia, nor about his fight with the company, where he has spent most of his adult life. But he is determined that what happened to him will never happen to anyone else. What do you want from the Boeing Company now, Bob Strom? The Boeing Company can't give me anything that I want. I want to live. At 35, Benazir Bhutto has become the first woman to lead a Muslim nation and the youngest prime minister in the world. Actually, it's, it's something very exciting. It's that sense of, of making history. And also, part of it comes, little part of it, from those who expect, perhaps, a woman to slip up. On campuses from Texas to New York, you can get your doctorate in Shakespeare or Tolstoy, or if you like, Lucy. Frankie, this is it. This is it. When we talk about I Love Lucy, of course, we're talking about the, the Greek drama of, uh, of the sitcom, the, the most ancient uh, sitcom from the, the formative stage. David Mark is a professor at Brandeis University. What did uh, Desi Arnaz, what, what did he really give us? A uh, lot of ideas here, deep in the American heart. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Harry Reisner. I'm Ed Bradley. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes. Shuttle altitude, 87,000 feet. Looking good. Look at that. Can you see it? Day, weekdays at noon. How many times have you told your children, no more television, do your homework, go read a book? That boob tube will rot your mind. Well, all that time, all seven hours a day, the average American adolescent spends in front of the set may not be the waste of time so many parents think it is. For example, at the University of Texas, an institution that excels in all the traditional academic disciplines, the sciences and the humanities, there is a group of students, graduate students, yeah. studying television. Commercial television, not as an industry, but as art. This seminar is on the dynamics of L.A. law. I think the other thing that's really important is that here you have a standoff between boss and employee. Right. And there, were, there was equal screen space being allotted to both of them. And it was all based on eyeline match. Right. So when you know Leland's sitting down, he's looking up to see Fuentes, you, you have that, that whole thing was balanced symmetrically. But at the end of the confrontation, the camera is now eye level. Let's see what they've got on the other channels. At the University of Wisconsin, an academic conference of educators and graduate students Those Indians will never catch that cowboy. immerse themselves first in the recurring themes of Burns and Allen. Then, a serious examination on the effects of network promos. These are some of the men and women who have put under the microscope an aspect of our culture most of us take for granted, the literature of our age. At campuses across the country, students are getting credit for watching and analyzing the Brady Bunch or Gilligan's Island, all the things a certain breed of academics had dismissed as chewing gum for the mind. A new breed sees much to think about. If it, you, you had to say, name some real garbage on television. The love boat seemed to be a real whipping boy for a long time. It was the quintessential bad television, the quintessential sort of escapist nonsense. And I'd like to suggest quite the contrary, saying that love boat, like a lot of television, is in fact very good art. In one class, students might be sweating over the symbolic imagery of King Lear. In another, students apply the same critical analysis, the same sweat, to moonlighting. 
And who's the boss? Some similarities. We have dominating female roles, and it's a teasing romance. Just as certain professors of the classics examine the minutiae of ancient manuscripts, the title pages, for example, here at the State University of New York, the opening titles of Dynasty hold secrets demanding explanation. Now, up till that point, I think everything's fine. But then, these images start coming, and the one that follows this is even more extraordinary. This time when you go, look where that champagne bottle is being held and what it's doing, becomes an unequivocal message. And all of a sudden you realize something is going on here that isn't supposed to be going on on American commercial television when the kids are still up. Robert Thompson is a professor at the State University of New York. Medieval Italians had Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, we had, you know, your images were your, your, the frescoes in your church. Television is our... 20th century art form. My name is Michael Anthony. Every sitcom ever made is examined and analyzed. Every commercial, every grain of dust in what someone called the vast wasteland now joins the romantic poets Shakespeare and the Iliad on the shelves of academia. Donahue, Billy Gray and Lauren Chapin in Father Knows Best. Horace Newcomb is chairman of the Department of Radio, Television and Film at the University of Texas. One of the founding fathers in the field of seriously watching television. What on earth do we have to learn from studying Gunsmoke, for example? Gunsmoke, I think, is one of the uh, important shows in the history of television. Uh, Gunsmoke was teaching us about race relations and showing us uh, how to defend human rights at a time when nobody was doing that overtly. There's no law that says we've got to have a lot of Chinamen around here. Chan, I told you we're welcome in Dodge and you are. If these two men bother you, you just come to me. Most of the time, particularly in shows like Gunsmoke, Bonanza, and so on in the 60s, what we were doing were taking contemporary ideas, putting them in the frame of the Western, which is very palatable, very familiar, very easy to understand, but we were putting rather important ideas in there. Television is us talking to ourselves about ourselves. Right there in front of us, we've got news, information, entertainment programs that talk about the things that we're afraid of, talks about our past, how we view our past, how we view our present how we'd like to view our future. Only a few brave professors teach television today, but each is producing a core of missionaries like these PhDs who themselves will be teaching. When we talk about good and bad quality on television, do you use the same yardsticks that you would use in dealing with literature? Yes and no. Yes and no. Character, for one thing, something people would talk about in terms of a novel. Character is something that TV does, as far as I'm concerned, better than any other medium because you have a character developing over, um, in the case of as the world turns, 30 years. Can we? We're talking about a soap opera. You know, that's the attitude. You can take away that attitude and say, you could say the same thing about opera. Well, uh, opera seems strange if you don't know its rules. It's a bunch of fat people singing the dialogue. How, what an absurd way to tell a story. Ricky, this is it. This is it. <laughs> When we talk about I Love Lucy, of course, we're talking about the, the Greek drama of, uh, of the sitcom, the, the most ancient uh, sitcom from the, the formative stage. David Mark is a professor at Brandeis University. What did uh, Desi Arnaz, what, what did he really give us? A uh, lot of ideas here, deep in the American heart. Native born and foreign, for example. All of those language jokes about Ricky's English. The men against the women and the plots where it's uh, Ricky and Fred against uh, Lucy and Ethel. We have old and young. We have landlord and tenant. Uh, all, all kinds of uh, possibilities, a web of comic possibilities. But when we think of art, we don't instinctively think of something, a product, uh, an artifact that is easily digested. The whole point of television is to make it easily digested. Uh, Moby Dick, for example, which you know generally acknowledged, uh, you know Melville's great novel, one of the great novels of American literature, was pretty much uh, thought of as a boy's adventure book. And yet, through a hundred years of reading, uh, we've come up with a great deal more. Looked at in a certain way, there is something Dickensian about Hill Street Blues, for example. I look at that show for one of the things that I didn't see written about it a lot, which is the presence of 
all of these bodily fluids that normally would not be in television. Every possible orifice you can think of, from the most accepted, like sweat, to the very most um, um, unaccepted for television, are represented on that show like crazy. Last name. G-U-E. Kuwait. Goo. First name? Lada. So then we'll say, look at that and say, why are these symbols, metaphors, allusions being used? And in Hill Street, I think it's real obvious, and it becomes a touching, meaningful piece of, uh, piece of work when you look at it this way. I mean, it's using this leaking, flatulating, puking human body to represent the body politic, to represent the collapsing city. That big mush mouth with the beer, he belongs there. The more popular the program, the more exacting is the analysis. Television shows, even sitcoms, are more than mere entertainment or literature. They are passageways into the American psyche. Understand us, goes the theory, by understanding the Dick Van Dyke show. Why? What's special about it? Well, one of the things I like about it very much is it's a kind of artifact from the Kennedy era, from the, the New Frontier period. Uh, even Mary Tyler Moore's hairdo in the, in, the, uh, in the show, there's something so jacky about it. There was a change going on in America. The paintings on the wall uh, showed a certain level of sophistication that uh, was not something uh, you'd see in the Andersons. Uh, home on, on Father Knows Best. And so uh, one, in a sense, can see the history of the situation comedy, which attempts to represent us in our living rooms, as a kind of uh, para-history of America, a companion text uh, for reading American history. Now, Hollywood Squares, let's talk about that for a second. What about the main rationale for these courses is that subject matter is less important than teaching people to critically analyze, be it poems of Shelley or the thoughts of Archie Bunker. I think uh, uh, applying, applying one's mind to a serious study is a formal act. And the content of that study is less important. You say the words Twilight Zone to 30 Americans who are 20 years old, and you push a button in them. Should we squander that energy? Or should we apply that energy to begin to understand how storytelling works in a culture? Do you think that the, the fellow academics in some of the more classical uh, disciplines, uh, who might be very critical of what you're doing, secretly go home, you bet turn out do. the lights, draw the curtains, and watch Hogan's Heroes. You and, bet and they do. Griffith. That's why I've finally sort of um, come out of the closet and quit. I mean, I have a BA from the University of Chicago in political philosophy, did my thesis on the Divine Comedy. I have an MA and a PhD from Northwestern. I read the great books of the Western world. I love television. It's very odd because on the one hand, I'm listening to you discuss this as an academic pursuit and, and uh, discussing the sensitivity of the plots and stuff. And on the other hand, I've heard a very successful producer in Hollywood describe what he does as a kind of assembly line. The door has to slam and you've got to make a joke exactly four and a half minutes into it. Mm -hmm. um, that's art. Uh, a sonnet has to rhyme A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G for a certain kind of sonnet. That's art. If uh, TV was just an assembly line, and we were getting just a, a homogenized product, then you'd have to agree that um, uh, MASH and the Dukes of Hazard are exactly the same. And I don't think that, I, I know that that's not true for me, and I don't think it's true for most viewers. And once you can begin to make distinctions, uh, we're in the realm of aesthetics, and now we're talking about art. It's a home appliance. It's a home appliance that that uh, is our most, most pervasive cultural storyteller. I'm, I'd be willing to suggest that 90% of it is junk. I also think that 90% of most any expressive form is junk. You know, my, my, my master's thesis, for example, was on the poetry of uh, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And I was really on a track uh, in, in the academy uh, towards a uh, degree in, in British Romantic poetry. I was very interested in Wordsworth who in his preface to the lyric ballads uh, uh, had written how poetry must be written in the language that people can understand 
and uh, that poetry must expand from its tiny base in the aristocracy to be uh, something uh, for the, uh, the, the, the mass of people. And in a very kind of ironic way, television fulfills that, uh, that dream that, that Wordsworth had. And if any of them say the sacred word, the duck will fly down and pay them a hundred dollars. Whatever television is, part Wordsworth, part merchandise mart, it is us, and is therefore something worth thinking about. Perhaps the best of all guides to the way we are and the way we were. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. Say good night. Good night. You might expect a guy who flies.